see you on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. So um, just want to call your attention just to a couple of the announcements in the bulletin. Um, Sunday, August 25th, um, or that's today, um, is an ice cream social over at Osage. So if you want some ice cream and some sandwiches um, and pies and cakes, uh, good place to go to have lunch today. Also, uh, Wednesday, or the homecoming committee meeting will be meeting at 6.30 here at the church, so keep that in mind. Also, our community breakfast will be starting uh, the first Thursday after September. That's September 5th, so hope to see you there. Also, choir practice will be starting September 18th, and also they're looking for volunteers to help with the cost trainers uh, beginning this fall in October. So keep all those things in mind as, as uh, you uh, uh, prepare for this fall. Also this week, uh, I will be gone for continued education, but uh, you can call my cell phone. I'll be back on Friday night. Uh, but if for any pastoral uh, needs you might have, the UCC church and in, in, uh, pastor in uh, Osage will be on call. Um, uh, so please feel, uh, feel free to call him Charles Owen. So um, I think they'll have the, uh, the number at the office. So any other announcements? Okay, so they're at the north end of the fellowship hall? Pardon? North end of the fellowship hall, you said? Yes. Okay, so feel free to pick one up. How about others? Any other announcements? If not, let us uh, show our video. Let's now stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. join me in the call to worship. <laughs> Give to the Lord your whole trust. Know that God has always and will always be with you. Worship God in confidence and peace. Let us pray. Lord God, whose power and mercies have exceeded all the ends of creation, Pour out your love out on today, that we might be healed and be made ready to serve you by serving others in the world that you have created. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our opening hymn.
Reading from the Old Testament, Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 10, Jeremiah's call and commission. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, O oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See today I appoint you o See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. A reading from Psalm 71, verses 1 through 12. We will sing the response. Do I take refuge? Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope. My trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have learned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been an example to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my, watch for my life consult together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is no deliverer. O God, be not far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. O oh Lord, you are my hope, my trust, Lord, from my youth. At this time, we'll invite the young people to come forward so I can have a moment with them. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. You guys excited for school to start? Yeah, starts Monday, right? Great. What's your favorite thing about school? What's your, your favorite subjects? Math? That's great. I wasn't so good in math. Reading? That's good. 
to E, yeah. Yeah, so all those are kind of fun. Do you have rules in school? Yeah. Do you like, do you have rules at home? And you never, never disobey the rules, right? I'll tell you what, I bet you do. I bet you they have too. What do you think? Think they have? Rules are good, aren't they? Really. They keep us safe. They help us do the right thing. Yeah. We need rules, right? Um, Jesus had rules too. Did you know that? Did you think Jesus kept all the rules? <laughs> kind of a trick question. Because day in the scripture, um, Jesus breaks the rules. That's kind of surprising, isn't it? Yeah. Because there was a rule you didn't do anything on Sundays. You didn't do anything on the Sabbath, which is our, our Sundays. And he does. He heals someone. But he broke the rule because he wanted to help someone. He, did, he, he knew that was more important at that point. So sometimes we, we have rules that are good. And the, the rule that he broke was good. But sometimes we have to take people are more important, don't we? So um, sometimes we do things to help out people, even though there might be a, a slight rule that's broken. So keep that in mind as we think about it. You know, one time, um, what's the speed limit on the roads? Do you know? 55, usually, on the roads. One time my dad was having a heart attack, and I was like 30 minutes from the nearest hospital, and I was driving. Do you think I went 55? Yeah, I went a little faster than 55. But I got him there, so he wouldn't, something wouldn't happen to him. So sometimes we break rules. The speed limit is good, but when you have to take someone else into consideration, you still have to take consideration of other people being safe on the road too, but yeah. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Oh, gracious and loving God, we are so thankful for the rules you have given to us that keep us safe and help us, but we know that people are far more important in times of, of, of uh, some rules. So help us to be... Uh, respectful of rules, but also help us to know that, that we need to um, put people above rules at times and help us to make wise decisions on that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can go sit down now. Please stand if you are able for the gospel reading. The Gospel reading is from Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. Jesus heals a crippled woman. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Our some text this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. And the story is part tragic and it's part hope. There's a woman who has this horrible disability, a woman who has bent over, doubled over, and she's been that way for 18 years. That's a long time to experience that. Imagine what life must have been like for her. All she could see basically was looking down at her feet and she couldn't look up out to the world and how difficult that would have been and how many things she would have missed in her life in those 18 years. This encounter takes place in the synagogue at a worship space that was strictly segregated by, by gender. Men sat on one side where they could ask the rabbi all kinds of questions and a point of law to learn more, and women sat on the other side, and basically they were expected to be uh, silent and just listen and not ask any questions. There's no indication that the bend over woman is doing anything that would, at all that would draw attention to her. On the contrary, the regular worshipers in that synagogue have probably been, uh, been growing up with, with this woman being bent over and used to her um, being bent over and really didn't really notice her all that much. And she probably was very quiet, just as she was expected to be quiet in the synagogue there. What could she have possibly done that would have drawn attention to her? Some wonder every once in a while to, to what also could be possible, what she could have possibly done to even have this bent, bent over for 18 years. Some might have said that it was, uh, it was uh, because of a punishment from God, but that's really not true um, uh, to see illness as God's punishment. That's not it at all. And as this woman is in this... Um, synagogue and they're worshiping, the woman is not asking for help. She's not asking for healing. She hasn't asked Jesus for anything. She just is going to worship in her quiet own way and in, in this meeting house and, and um, she's kind of probably having this very distinct shuffle of her feet if she's had this bent overness uh, in her life and in her quiet way, she's just there. A few probably even noticed her. They're probably very used to her being there and being there with her uh, dis disabled, being disabled. Except for Jesus. Jesus seems to notice her. And he resolved, he's decided that he's going to do something to help her. Notice the text says, he says, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. She didn't go to him. She called, he called her over. The healing is not her idea at all. It's his. Jesus isn't just 
sitting in the synagogue among the other worshipers on this Sabbath day. No, in verse 10 it says, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. So he was teaching. He wasn't just there to worship. He was teaching. Jesus actually interrupts his sermon to minister to this individual, to this poor woman who doesn't even seem to have asked him for any help. Listen to Luke's and how, how he relates it. Relates it. He tells us that this was the Sabbath, and that's important. Then the key to understanding what is really happening here, he also tells us that the woman had her condition for 18 years. Now, both of these, these points are very important in the scripture. What he is saying here is this. There was, this was not an emergency case at all. He could have waited until everything was said and done and then approached the woman. She had been disabled for 18 years. Surely she could have waited just a few minutes longer. It could have even easily waited until the next day. This was not an emergency room situation. Now, it could have been, it could have been maybe a child, maybe having a high fever and needed immediate attention. It was an immediate danger of dying, but this wasn't the case for this particular woman. And that would have made perfect sense to the synagogue leaders if it would have been an emergency situation. But the kind of healing would have undermined the point in which I think Jesus is trying to make in this, in this uh, action. Jesus was purposely breaking the law to make a point. And the point was people are more important than rules. We need to remember this from time to time. We need to be reminded of this from time to time. The synagogue uh, ruler did not see it that way because he had dehumanized this woman. Once you dehumanize someone you can, and you label them, you can easily just dismiss them. So I think this, not only was this um, well, not only was she a woman who was to be quiet in worship, but it was also, um, she had also been dehumanized. Two things happen when you become and have a legalistic spirit. Your rules rule you, and the rules supersede the, the, way, the well-being of others. So let me tell you a story. There was a certain man who went into the woods one day, seeking in a bird of interest that he might find, and he caught this young eagle. He brought it home, put it among the ducks and the turkeys and the chickens, and gave it chicken food, and even though it was uh, the king of birds, it became like a chicken. Five years later, a naturalist came to see him, and after passing through the garden, he said, that bird is an eagle. It's not a chicken. Yes, says the owner, but I've trained it to be a chicken. It no longer is an eagle. And the naturalist said, no, 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 no. It's an eagle. It has the heart of an eagle. It is the wingspan of an eagle. And, it will help, and I will help it soar high in the heavens. No, said the owner. It's a chicken. It'll never fly. They agreed to test and find out to see if it could become an eagle. The naturalist picked up the eagle, held it up, with great intensity, he said, Eagle, you are an eagle. You belong to the sky and not the earth. Stretch your wings and fly. And the eagle turned this way. The eagle turned this way. He looked down. He saw the chickens eating their food. And he jumped down and began to eat with the chickens. And the owner said, I told you, it's a chicken. The naturalist said, no, it's an eagle. Give it another chance tomorrow. So the next day, he took it to the top of the house. He said, eagle, you are an eagle. Stretch your wings and fly. But again, the eagle looked down, saw the chickens eating the food, jumped out of the man's hands, went down to the ground, and began to eat like a chicken. The owner said, I told you, it's a chicken. No, said the naturalist, it's an eagle. It has the heart of an eagle. Only give it one more chance and I will make it fly tomorrow. 
The next morning he rose early and took the eagle outside the city and away from the houses to the foot of a high mountain. The sun was just rising, giving the top of the mountain a color of gold. And every cringe was glistening in the joy of the beauty of that morning. He picked up the eagle and said to it, Eagle, you are an eagle. You belong to the sky and not the earth. Stretch out your wings and fly. The eagle looked around and trembled as if new life were coming to it, but it didn't fly. The naturalist then grabbed its head and made it look straight at the sun. Suddenly it stretched out its wings and with the screech of an eagle, it flew out of his hands and mounted higher and higher and never returned. Though it had been kept tame as a chicken, it remembered it was an eagle. And that is with us. You see, you take us humans and put us among turkeys and chickens in the world and give us rules to live by and tell us that we are moral people so long as we live by those rules and we will continue to live out our lives in the meager existence. But you let someone like Christ come along, straighten our backs, and point our heads towards the heavens, and suddenly we realize we are sons and daughters of Abraham. We are God's chosen people. We're not chickens. We are eagles. Society has a way of dehumanizing us, when we allow this to happen, we fail to see our worth before God. The bent over woman in the synagogue ruler's opinion was only a woman and of little value. The law was more important than the woman, let alone a disfigured woman. Listen to this now. The woman's back was bent. That much is true. But a legalistic spirit bent over souls all the more. Nothing can choke the heart and soul of our God with legalism. I am the first person to say that, as a, that a Christian ought to be disciplined, ought to have rules, but when that becomes rigid in our beliefs, it is uh, a sign that the disciplines of the Christian, Christian life has crippled us. Does this mean that we don't have to have rules? Of course not. I believe we do. But to it suggests that we must be careful not to let our rules rule us. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus comes to us as a restorer of, restorer of humanity. God sees each of us as a unique individual precious to God. His healing that he did on that Sabbath couldn't wait. To him, this woman's healing is an urgent matter. He interprets his, in, he interrupts his teaching to deliver this joyous news. You are set free. Then he steps over and lays hands on her. In an instant, she is standing upright, seeing the world around her in a whole different way. What wonder, what marvel that is. Surely there are tears of joy on many cheeks as a congreg congregation witnesses this wonderful miracle that has taken place. But at least one face, face in the crowd remains dry, and there are no tears on the face of the leader of the synagogue. Far from being filled with joy, the man is irritated. He says, but it's the Sabbath day. There's a law against that. He, six days of the week you can perform this work, but why do you have to do it on the Sabbath? When f faithful people like us are prohibited from doing work of any kind. You see, there's nothing really wrong with the synagogue leader's approach here. Keeping the commandments, Jesus would affirm that, is a good thing, a faithful thing, but it's not enough. For our Lord, there's something else that's more important than virtue. It's, it's, the, it's, it's understood that there's reaching out in the name of God to bring about graceful transformation. 
And that is exactly what Christ did in that healing. In our gospel reading, it's like there is no one present in the congregation who is more desperate for transformation than this woman who has been bent over for 18 years. But she hasn't come to the synagogue specifically for healing. That's not even what she probably even had in mind when she came to that synagogue. She may not even feel she deserves healing, but buying the, buying the line that so many have fed her over the years that, that her bent over posture is God's punishment for sin. So she may not even, even be seeking or even think she deserves any kind of healing. But her heart is weary all the same. She yearns to look up. She learn, yearns to live. Because Jesus is all about grace, she receives at his hand a marvelous free gift of being upright in her posture. Because of that gift, she now has a chance at a normal life. To Jesus, administrating such a life-changing gift is well worth interrupting this, his synagogue teaching. In many ways, it may be well that, that this act of healing itself is the greatest lesson he offers that day. Francis Assisi's um, St. Francis of Assisi is famed for having taught his spiritual brothers and sisters. This is what he used to teach them. He said, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. Nothing proclaims the, the word grace more than the sight of this woman's spine straightening out. Seemingly on its own accord as she stands upright for the first time in 18 years. Besides the wonder of this mighty sight, the little details that had happened on the Sabbath fades into insignificance. At this, I'm convinced, the entire town present at that synagogue that morning wanted to shout with joy, and the rule and authority shut it down, and that's a shame. Sometimes you simply have to express joy. Because of a healing or accomplishment or a victory, you have to shout out, Thank you, God. This healing that Jesus does on the Sabbath tells us to never count out people. If they're sick, heal them. If they're down on their luck, assist them. If they're not up to the task, teach them. If they have a burden, lift it. If they have failed, Encourage them. Jesus provided for this woman what no one else could give her, a whole body. He healed her. Now there is no way that the synagogue leaders could have healed this woman, woman's back, but, but the very least he could have done was show her some respect and provide her some dignity, and at the very least celebrate with her. Jesus would have, would have us learn from these events in the synagogue. We cannot all be heal, healers, but we can treat, uh, treat one another like sons and daughters of Abraham. As people who have, have worth in God's eyes, my friends, this will give you and me a spirit of joy. I want to ask you a question. Does anybody remember what Jesus was teaching in the synagogue that day? What his scripture text was? Or where he is going with the interpretation? Does anybody remember that? You see, we have no idea. Because Luke didn't think it was important enough to even record it. It was not Jesus' words from the pulpit that day that caused such agitation in the synagogue's leader. In the, in the synagogue's leader. The, the words are forgotten. Luke doesn't even mention them. It was his deed, his grace-filled action that restored this woman to a normal life. This gift came to her freely beyond uh, her, her deserving even, even. It was grace. It was pure grace. Followers of Jesus have celebrated it ever since. So yeah, rules are important. But when the rules rule us, and we don't, and rules are more important than people, I think we've missed the mark. Jesus is telling us, 
grace. Extend that grace to all. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, we are so thankful for your love. We're so thankful for your grace. And help us all to also to extend that grace to others. We know rules are important. We know they help us in our daily living. And as Christians, we are called to be disciplined. But also help us see that rules don't rule us and that people are far more important. And help us to reach out to others in the same grace that you reached out to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us not come together as a community of faith to share with one another our joys and concerns so that we can be in prayer for each other in this coming week and also so we can lift them up to God. Are there joys and concerns you'd like to share this morning? Okay, Lord. Okay, okay, Lord, in your mercy. How about others? It's nice to have guests from Vinton here. Yes, yeah, so we have some guests from uh, Vinton and the church, the last church I served. So it's good to have you guys here. So welcome, Lord, in your mercy. How about others? Let's keep the family of Edna Roll in our prayers and her passing as uh, last week. Lord, in your mercy. How about others? If not, let us bow our heads in silent prayer. O gracious and loving God, you are the God of peace. We come here with things that at times can rob, rob us of that peace. We may have inner conflict that we might be experiencing, the struggles of the, of the mind, jealousies that causes unrest. May your spirit minister to our spirits. May your love cause us to see others with love. And may your grace open us up to forgive others. Mend our minds through worship here as we become aware of conflict that might be within us. Give us insight that will lead to healing action. Help with our jealousies that make us unhappy. Lead us as though things that affirm others and as we may, may have some hostility that keeps us angry, guide us by grace to speak words of forgiveness. We want our worship to make a difference in our living. We pray for more than just good feelings about ourselves. We know we need more than new thoughts. We sense that we need new actions, new, new responses towards those that trouble us, new ways to speak to those whom we dis distrust, new ways to care for others whom we ignore. As we gather here this morning, we gather to pray for our church family, for those that are ill and home or in the hospital, those who have had surgery. We pray for those who grieve the loss of one deeply loved. We pray for those who wrestle with difficult situations and difficult decisions. We pray for those who are alone and lonely even though they're with others. We pray for those who find it hard to believe and to trust. Guide us in ministering to each other. Keep us aware of each other's pain. Help us to listen when, when others speak. Lead us to respond with gentle care. We pray all these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time we invite the ushers to come forward to receive a morning tithes and offering. join me in the prayer of dedication. Gracious and giving God, you have poured your blessing down on us like a summer downpour or a waterfall, sustaining and refreshing us. The gift we dedicate to you are small token in comparison to your goodness. But we pray that we offer you the knowledge that we long to grow in generosity. May our giving inspire justice and righteousness grow in swift and mighty rivers of our midst. We pray in the name of Jesus, the living God. Amen. Lord, this day you have healed and restored us. You have given us new strength and courage to serve you in this world. Now we go in peace and confidence, ready to be your people in places at all times. Praise be to you, mighty God of love and mercy. Amen.